Hello and good evening. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. This is a series of webinar uh, on updates of glycemic control biomarkers and diabetes. Um, this program is um, uh, organized by Emory Diabetes Training Academy, and I would like to thank EKF for providing uh, an, an educational grant to Emory University to organize this program. Um, we have so far four lectures. We had diabetologists, endocrinologists, epidemiologists, nephrologists. Today we'll have Dr. Cyrus de Souza, uh, who is a great collaborator. Um, he will be discussing the validation and studies of glycated albumin as a marker for glycemic control. Dr. de Souza is a professor of medicine and chief of endocrinology at the University of Nebraska and a well-known researcher in the area of glycemic control monitoring. He's been, he was the first author of some of the validation and studies for glycated albumin. I would like to thank you, uh, Cyrus, and thank you so much for participating and welcome all the audience and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and good evening. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to talk to you about the clinical utility of glycated albumin and fructosamine. Uh, my name is Saras de Souza, and I'm the Professor and Chief of Diabetes Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of Nebraska Medical Centers, Omaha, Nebraska. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. So the objectives of today's talk is to review the clinical advantages and disadvantages of the common available measurements of glycemic control, such as A1C, glycated albumin, and fructosamine. We're going to discuss the ability of glycated albumin and fructosamine to predict diabetes-related complications. And then <clears throat> in a much more useful part of the presentation, we're going to um, assess the utility how do we apply the use of glycated albumin and fructosamine in three clinical scenarios? One is insulin titration or other medication titrations, uh, pregnancy and gestational diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. So in the first part, we're gonna look at the clinical advantages and disadvantages of all these different parameters. The first slide would be the hemoglobin A1C. So the main advantages are it's very accurate and it is very well standardized. So you can depend on it anywhere. <clears throat> um, it is a well-established risk predictor for complications. So we have many, many large studies that have used A1C as the predictor for micro and uh, macrovascular complications. And it is an excellent surrogate for about a two to three month glycemic control period. The disadvantages are that there are several conditions um, that interfere with A1C measurements, such as chronic kidney disease, high red cell turnover, hemoglobinopathies, um, and we are unable to predict glycemic variation in hypoglycemia very accurately with A1C. There is a limited clinical utility in making short-term changes in insulin uh, with A1C. So the clinical advantages and disadvantages of glycated albumin and fructosamine, um, they are both detect short-term changes in glucose about two to three weeks. These assays are slightly less costly than A1C. And glycated albumin, fructosamine are both highly correlated to A1C. Glycated albumin specifically can be used in CKD and pregnancy, which are high red cell turnover conditions. Um, so they are, it's useful over there. However, there are some disadvantages. Um, glycated albumin and fructosamine can be very unreliable in protein losing states, such as um, you know, glomerular nephropathies um, that have protein loss. Uh, fructosamine can also be affected by high immunoglobulins. 
Both of these assays can be affected by reducing agents such as high bilirubin and high vitamins such as high vitamin C. Um, now we will look at different markers that help us uh, clinically for glycemic control. The first is the plasma glucose, which gives you an eight to 10 hour interval of what's going on during that time. The mean plasma glucose and glycemic variability in diesels usually give us a 24 to 72 hour picture of what's going on with the glucose. The 1,5-anhydroglucidol gives you a three-day to five-day um, time period where you can see what the blood sugars are doing in the past and during that time. Glycidyl albumin and fructose amine about two to three weeks, and then A1C is two to three months. So what are the principles of measurements of glycidyl albumin? Uh, first, we eliminate the gly um, glycated part of the amino acid. <clears throat> and this is through a ketose amine oxidase reaction. Um, then we determine the glycated albu albu albumin by a coloration reaction. And so um, it is quantified that way. Then we determine what is the albumin amount by an oxidation and coloration reaction, which also quantifies the amount of albumin. Glycidyl albumin is then expressed as a percentage between glycated albumin concentration and albumin concentration. This is, uh, gives us an advantage because it eliminates the variations in albumin that might be present individually. So the correlation between <clears throat> serum uh, glycated albumin and fructose amine in type two diabetes is very strong. As you can see, the R squared is 0.85 over here. The correlation between glycated albumin and A1C as shown in the DCCT is also very strong at R squared of 0.75. There is estimation of what the different fructose amine levels mean in terms of A1C. And we do it through a distribution in the normal population. And in populations, you can see the standard deviations above and below the mean. And thus these frequencies are determined. So here is a chart of comparative values for glycated albumin, hemoglobin A1C, fasting plasma glucose, and the two are OGTT time points. So we can take a couple of examples. For example, up in the chart, the glycated albumin percentage of 13% is about 5.6% for A1C. 89 milligrams per deciliter for fasting glucose and about 114 milligrams per deciliter for OGTT 2R. And looking at the diabetes range, you can see around 20.5 for glycated albumin is about 7 A1C and 121 fasting glucose in about 210 to our postprandial. Here we look at the, in this study, we look at the association between glycated albumin and microvascular complications. So you can see in group one, which is normal, and then group two diabetes and group three diabetes with microvascular complications. As we look at these groups, the glycated albumin, it goes higher and higher, which is a good correspondence with the progression of disease and complications. In this slide, we look at another few studies that 
uh, look at glycated albumin and factors that are and A1C, and you can see how they're related to microvascular disease. So in the ERIC study, which was published in Lancet Diabetes 2014, all of the three parameters, glycated albumin and fructose amine and A1C, were um, strongly associated with retinopathy, nephropathy, and CKT. In the DCCT EDIC study, um, glycated albumin and A1C were strongly associated with retinopathy and nephropathy. Um, similarly, <clears throat> in another study looking at peripheral neuropathy, both of these parameters were also strongly associated. And when I say strongly associated, I mean directly. That means the higher the A1C and higher the glycated albumin, the more likely you are to get these complications. Here we look at the macrovascular aspects. Um, there are three studies which I have listed. The ERIC study, again published in circulation 2014, looked at heart failure and total mortality. And you can see all of the three parameters were strongly correlated directly. So was carotid IMT, which is a surrogate marker, intimate media thickness of the carotid is a surrogate marker of uh, cardiovascular disease. And you can see again, that there was a strong association. And then in the last study, they looked at the major adverse cardiovascular events in a trial, which is um, the combination of stroke, MI, and cardiovascular death. Indeed, this was also, this composite was also very strongly associated with these markers. So here we look at this in a little more detail. The first column is heart failure and the second column is all-cause mortality. So in A, we're looking at fructosamine. In B, we are looking at glycated albumin. And in C, we are looking at A1C for the heart failure group. And you can see with the solid line um, that there is a definitive correlation between a higher value of these glycemic parameters and heart failure incidence. There is a little difference between the A1C and the other two in terms of the low end of the spectrum. In fructose amine and glycated albumin, the low end also is related to an increase in the incidence of heart failure, uh, not so in terms of A1C in this particular study. In terms of all-cause mortality, which is D, E, and F, um, the fructosamine, glycated albumin, and A1C show a similar relationship with the solid black line increasing with increasing values. The dotted lines on all this whole chart is the confidence intervals. Here also the pattern um, in all three shows that for very low values, uh, you do have a slight increased instance of all-cause mortality, which may be a marker for severe illness. Here we look at dementia, which is very common in long-term type two diabetes, especially um, many times due to vascular injury. Um, if you look at A1C, uh, which is the first graph, we can see a direct correlation. Um, the graph below that is the glycated albumin. We also see a strong direct correlation. Um, the 1,5-anhydroglucetol um, has a um, relationship, but it is not as strong as the other three. Um, and fructosamine, as usual, has the same sort of look as A1C in glycated albumin. <clears throat> so considering all this data, um, Nathan et al. Um, had a discussion about um, making a composite sort of um, marker which included 
glycated albumin and A1C so that this could depict progressive injury to blood vessels. So you have the intermediate term with glycated albumin and the long term with A1C to make a sort of staging system that might be very helpful to understand the progression of diabetes microvascular disease. So we come to the third part of our talk, which is the clinical implications and how do you use glycated albumin. We're gonna look at uh, intermediate use of glycated albumin as a mediator or as an intermediate marker. We're gonna look at chronic disease, kidney disease, pregnancy, including GDM and diabetes, insulin titration medication changes, and any conditions that shorten the erythrocyte survival or decrease in erythrocyte age, examples being anemia and hemoglobinopathies. So insulin use. Um, there have been several conferences, um, you know, uh, discussing A1C use. And A1C use is very um, useful for patients who are on oral medications because the titration is done once every two to three or four months. But in insulin, when you have a titration schedule um, that is every three or four days, um, that could be problematic because A1C will not show that. SMBG can, um, in a continuous glucose monitor can. But they are high, more invasive uh, in, in terms of workload for the patient. Um, more technologically problematic for older people. And so is there a way to look at shorter term, term and that would be glycated albumin, which is why glycated albumin is, is recommended in these types of patients. So if you look at um, the SMBG and CGM, they have a very close relationship in this study where uh, we had looked at patients who were receiving changes in the medications um, to improve their glycemic status. We can see the slow drift down, but they are going more or less in conjunction. But what you can also see is the immense variability with the bars going up and down between those dots and triangles. So there's huge variability um, in terms of uh, SMBG and CGM. Now, in that same study, we can look at um, the indicators in one patient that was fairly well correlated. So this is a good example of a patient where everything correlates fairly well. So you can see the top um, blue um, uh, squares that, that that line is A1C and it smoothly goes down over 12 weeks. The red mean blood glucose is fairly consistently smooth and not that much variable. And it also goes down over 12 weeks. A1, the fructosamine in the yellow triangles and the um, glycated albumin, the purple um, diamonds, both are smoothly going down over 12 weeks. But this is the best case scenario. Let's look at another combination of all the patients and you'll see what the problem is. As you can see in this, when you combine a lot of people, that there is a lot of noise. If you would focus on the red dots first and the red dotted line, that is the mean blood glucose. And you can see that it is highly variable um, it has, uh, it goes down and up, down and up through the 12 weeks. Now, when we look at the glycated albumin, it gives us a different story. It does tell you that it goes down in the first four weeks. There is then a little jump between week four and eight, and then a sort of slight decline between eight and 12 weeks. Now, when you're doing insulin titration, this might be important because you're looking at short-term intervals and you can adjust accordingly. 
But look at the A1C. It is sort of much smoother. It keeps going down and down and down. And you wouldn't know that all these variations are taking place during the 12 week period. So that's why uh, glycated albumin and FRA might be very useful, especially if the patient doesn't want to poke themselves seven times a day or um, you know, do a CGM technology. Um, it may be good for those type of people. Here we look at uh, the relationship between different indices in A, glycated albumin and, a, uh, and the mean blood glucose have a fair relationship, a moderate relationship about, of about 0.46 correlation. And so does fructosamine in B similarly. Now, if you focus on D, uh, you will see that the relationship between A1C and mean blood glucose is very poorly correlated. It's a very small correlation of 0.26. Um, that is because of the variability of mean blood glucose and A1C does not capture this variability and therefore the correlation is not that great and therefore your titration will not be accurate with A1C. Now we move on to pregnant women including GTM and diabetes. So glycated albumin is associated with neonatal complications in a couple of studies I will soon show you. Um, in iron deficiency anemia, which is a very common in some countries and is associated with a higher A1C due to ferritin changes. And um, A1C keep, is increased in late pregnancy in non-diabetes individuals going to iron deficiency. So if you look at complications, in infants of mothers with diabetes with a cutoff value of 15.8, which is about an A1C of 6%, you will see that in regards to hypoglycemia, respiratory disorders, hypocalcemia, myocardial hypertrophy, enlarged for date, all of them showed a fairly high specificity and an odds ratio of between three to five times uh, that of known diabetes uh, mothers. So that's pretty significant. Shows you that glycated albumin can predict some of these complications. Now the influence of ferritin in pregnancy. So as you can see in figure A, the triangles over time, ferritin is going to come down. And as ferritin comes down, the hemoglobin A1C in the squares will go up. This is not meaning your blood glucose is going up. It is just an, it's a function of pregnancy and ferritin levels. Meanwhile, glycated albumin is fairly steady and does not get affected. These are the round uh, lines with the rounds. So you can see that it's probably very useful in pregnancy. In B, um, it's just a relationship of A1C and ferritin, which was all, uh, sort of the same as an A. While you can see glycated albumin is not much affected. Those are the clear circles. So in uh, CKD, in with diabetes, it was uh, the ADA consensus conference reports um, states that glycated albumin is less affected by a low GFR or other confounding conditions. And this is because the erythrocyte survival times become shorter as the EGFR falls. And this results in a lower, a artificially lower A1C. Um, the onset of anemia associated with uh, CKD is also linked to deficiencies of iron folate erythropoietin, and each of these uh, can influence uh, the A1C levels. So it is probably advisable that you use um, the glycated albumin. 
This is a relationship of A1C in, in uh, patients with the average glycemic control in, in terms of glucose in milligrams per deciliter. Well, what we're seeing is that people wait in without CKD. So you can see the clear circles and the dashed lines of people that do not have CKD. And then the solid black line and the solid black circles of people who have CKD. And in Let's focus on figure A. You can see that the A1C has a different A1C for people or in all type ranges of glucose for those who do and do not have CKD. There's a significant difference. Now let's focus on B, where you can see this difference does not exist for glycated albumin. It is very close together. So that means glycated albumin is not affected by the kidney status. Um, this is further um, specified in C and D, where it is compared to standard deviations of plasmic control instead of just the average glucose. In, the next, in this slide, we are looking at the glycated albumin levels and if they predict survival in patients with diabetes who are in stage renal disease on hemodialysis. So the glow glycated albumin level in um, 29% is approximately an A1C of 9.5. You can see that people who had an more than around 9.5 A1C or GA of 29% or more had a lesser survival than people who had a lower A1C on average or lower glycated albumin on average. So glycated albumin therefore is a good marker for prognostic value in long-term survival in patients with hemodialysis. So <clears throat> in summary, uh, glycated albumin and fructosamine are better at detecting variability, hypoglycemia and short-term fluctuations that may not be able to be seen by A1C. And especially in patients that may not be comfortable in doing a lot of SMBGs or dealing with the technology of the CGM. Glycated albumin is expressed as a ratio of al against albumin, which makes it more reliable. And it is, um, probably cheaper than A1C. Glycated albumin is a fairly good prognostic indicator for all those futurist complications in terms of macrovascular and microvascular diabetes complications, as we have discussed. And glycated albumin is clinically useful as a clinical tool in short-term titration, especially of insulin. Um, also during pregnancy and in the setting of <clears throat> chronic kidney disease. So with that, um, I will end my presentation and I will be glad to take any questions. Thank you.